if you'll open your Bibles, and then I'm going to have prayer with you. We're going to talk about the selection of deacons from a biblical standpoint. Uh, 1 Timothy. We're in 1 Timothy. I've taken this from 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 8 through 13. And let me tell you, we have always had wonderful deacons because we, we select them by the word of God. We examine them by the word of God and they serve by the word of God. And over the years, so I've been doing this, I've been doing this since 1974 with Doctrinal Studies Church and then we came out and incorporated into Grace Valley We've been doing this a long time, and I'll tell you, anybody who has ever been around us knows we've had really outstanding deacons, and and this will not, we will not vary from that. These men are are worthy of honor, and so we're in, we're selecting. Notice in verse eight, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, uh, not double tongued, not addicted to much wine not fond of sordid gain. We'll talk about all these. Holding the mystery of the faith, that's mystery doctrines of the church age, with a clear conscience, is not waffling about them. These men must also first be tested. That's what we're doing. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Their wives, women, their wives, must likewise be dignified. I'll explain why that's wives. Must likewise be dignified if they're married, at not malicious gossips, temperate, faithful in all things of the church. Then he comes back to the deacon. Deacons must be husbands of one wife, a good manager of their children at home, in their household. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So we're going to explain that to you. Notice something really interesting now. There are seven qualifications. Do you see that on your paper? One, two, three, four. Do you see that? Wait, do you look down there and see seven qualifications? All right. All right. Seven qualifications. The second thing is there are 12 qualifications. There are seven things that we're going to study. There are 12 qualifications, and there are five disqualifications. When you see the word not, that disqualifies that person to serve as a deacon. Do you understand that? <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to explain this. This is why we have always been able to select honorable, godly people who have served with such great honor in our church. And we have not missed the beat since 1974 to do this. <clears throat> and I'm looking for the same thing here. I'm looking for us to really be prayerful and find these men, if married, and their wives that are committed to the church of Jesus Christ and this church specifically, okay? So let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Remember, we want the truth out of here, and the Holy Spirit will give it to us if we will lean upon him called walk in the spirit and not the flesh. Confession of personal sin, mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue and overt sins are confessed in silence and privacy to allow the Holy Spirit to be the great teacher. I'm a communicator, but the great teacher is the Holy Spirit. He is the spiritual inspiration and power behind the word of God. So we thank you for that, Father. We pray today as we look at selecting a board of deacons and membership, founding members of this church that will take this church, Father, in Sinclair County to unbelievable places. And we're looking forward to seeing that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I guess you're over football for the weekend, right? My, my, my. I had to give that thing up about halftime.
They have some kind of sanity in my life. Uh, so here we are. So I've, I want to get that out of my, my way and out of our way so that we can focus on this. <clears throat> seven areas of examination. There are seven areas of examination. Notice that in the verse 8, they are men of dignity. I wrote the Greek word down because it may need a little explanation. I think if you looked it up in a good English dictionary, that would be some, a dictionary 10, 10 or 20 years ago. <laughs> you, would, you would find this word semdas means to be seriously minded about the work of the church. Seriously minded. The work of the church is the work of the Lord, isn't it? I mean, it's his church. And so they need to be serious minded. Notice something that in point number one, we're talking about the deacon themselves, and look down at point four, we're talking about the wife of a deacon. And notice she is she needs to qualify by dignity as well. They both have to be qualified by dignity. They need to be serious minded about the function and importance of the church of Jesus Christ. We live in the dispensation called the church. The church is everything. America is in trouble today. Not because there's evil in the world. There's always been evil in the world. There will always be evil in the world until the millennium. Because the guy who promotes it is the devil. Right? If you take the D off the front of his name, you got what he promotes. So, you really have to be, the husband and the wife have to both be seriously minded about the church of Jesus Christ. If America falls, it will be because of the church. Because the church is the divine agency or the custodians of the word of God in evangelism. The world is not. Our nation is not, the church is. And if America, if, you, if you're worried about America, you should be worried about the church. You should be worried about the church. Now watch this. Watch what he now explains what he means by dignity. What he means by being seriously minded about the church. He says not double tongue, referring to a pattern of sins of the tongue in their life, like gossip, maligning, slander. You can read about it in James 3, where he talks about the tongue. Notice, not double tongue. When I was a kid, we used to call it the forked, forked tongue. A double tongue, forked tongue. Not addicted to much wine, refers to a pattern of alcohol or drugs. Not fond of, of sordid gain, is a reference to greed and covetousness. A deacon must understand, like any spiritual mature believer, <clears throat> that your money is not yours. You know why? Because your life isn't yours. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Go to 1 Corinthians 6 with me. And, of course, we have a classic case of a, of a member, a leadership member that did have covetousness and greed. Judas is scared. Judas is scared. In the 6th chapter, verse 19 and 20, do you not know that your body, the human body, redeemed human body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Now watch, he's talking about the body and the person. For you, the person, have been bought with a price, therefore you glorify God in your body. You see the connection? Yeah, well, you should. Right? So there, here are three things that would disqualify you. Double-tongued, addiction to alcohol or drugs, and money. 
You serve God, not mammon. Remember, Jesus called it mammon. Details of life. You are not your own. You've been bought. Lock, stock, and barrel, we used to say. You've been bought. Your life is not your own. And the quicker you realize that, the better off you're going to be. And it's a high qualification of being a deacon. Just like me, my life. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. My life belongs to Jesus Christ, and he assigned me the church, and the church is my life. It's my high calling. And it has nothing to do with how many people. It has to do with who the people are. As long as it's not the roof, we're okay. Everything else can fall. So, there are three disqualifications, agreed? One qualification in that, and three disqualifications, agreed? They have to be men of dignity, and then three nots. The spiritual growth qualification is they have to be people who hold the mystery of the faith. Hold to the mystery of the faith. Now, that's really important. What does he mean? How, how is there a mystery to faith? Well, listen to this. Mystery to faith. Where do, what does that mean? Well, listen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, agree? So the mystery has to do with what we're holding by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. What is our dispensation? What dispensation do we live in? What age? We live in the church age. So there are mystery doctrines to the church. The church itself is a mystery doctrine. It's what separates the first coming from the second coming. We wouldn't know there was. If you read the Old Testament, there was no separation in the coming of Christ. But there is. We look for, we believe Christ has come. We think he's coming back. And what sits in between these two? The church. The church. So the mystery, uh, the mysteries of your dispensation, of the time of your ministry, the th interesting thing that every generation of believers from the beginning of Adam have had to fight for the cause of Christ. Every generation. When you read the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew or Luke or, or Genesis 5 or 11 or wherever you find it, every generation, the secret is they're listed by generation. Every generation has to fight for the cause of Christ or you lose it. Every generation has to fight for it. We have to fight for the truth of God's word. We have to fight for it. We fight for it every day in the angelic conflict. And uh, therefore, Bible study is really important to your life and the ability to know what is truth and to share it with others. You know, one of the things that really excite me, it's true in Moody, it was true everywhere we have been. Young people, get a hold of the Word of God, listen to me, and they share it with their friends. And they do a magnificent job with it. And I got a bunch of guys sitting here on the front row up here. They're these quality of people. They hear the truth and they just fight for it. And they share it in their generation, in their ways, and in their terms. Sometimes I listen to them share, and I go like, whoa. But I remember I did it, and my people that were over me looked at me and went, whoa. Because of the, the, the language and the way you conduct yourself within the generation you're living. Different dialogues and different stuff going on, but the passion is there. And I am so excited about that. The passion is there. And so, <clears throat> holding the mystery. Watch the, watch. There's two times it says you got to hold something. Watch this now, point number two. Holding to mystery of the faith refers to the consistency of walking by means of the faith cycle in the new covenant doctrines of the church. 
in the new covenant doctrines of the church. You've got to hold these new doctrines, the doctrines of the church. You have to go up. And people go like, well, I believe in the Old Testament does this and does that. I don't know. Depends on whether Christ fulfilled it, right? We don't, we don't hold to something that he's already fulfilled. Like we don't get circumcised because we think it's going to lead us to Christ, right? Well, I hope you know that. We have, listen, we live in the gen. Holy catfish. <laughs> I'm going to hurry along with this thing. This is a, we got a hold of something, a hold of the mystery of faith, right? That, that is the faith cycle, bringing the doctrines of the church, out, putting them on the front line of our ministries, putting it on the front line. People don't know anything about the mysteries of the church, the mystery doctrines. They don't, listen, and, and listen, that's okay because we'll teach them, right? We'll teach them. We will teach them. So you got to hold it. You got to hold it and take it out. Holding to a clear conscience refers to the consistency in walking by means of the of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You don't. You don't. Uh, the clear conscience. A clear conscience that you have hold of the truth and the truth will set you free. John eight thirty two. The third qualification. Notice there is a not one in it. A spiritual qualified. They first must be tested. Not a new convert, but here's the positive part. But, but one able to be tested. A deacon has got to be able to be tested. He's got enough doctrine to stand up against a, an assault, right? Able to be tested. Not a new convert, because a new convert, a baby's not able. He can't be a new convert, can't be a baby believer, has to have enough doctrine under his belt to be able to stand some of the testing. So that's a qualification. Not a new convert. The qualification has to be mature enough. You see, there's the positive. Able, able to be tested. Listen, key passage, circle it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken us. It has to be that character of person. And also, they must be above reproach. Above reproach. In other words, they need to be above reports to serve diakonia, and that's an imperative, faithfully the Lord's church. They must be above reproach. In other words, people can't be challenged all the time by the way you live, your attitude, etc. Listen, they can challenge it, but they're wrong, right? They've got to be proven wrong, not right. Above reproach means you go ahead and test me. You can challenge me with that. But you, you, better, you better know what you're talking about. You better know what you're talking about. They said we need to be above reproach. We can't be accused of something and find out, well, it was true after an examination. Okay? Above reproach in order to serve faithfully the Lord's church. Here's four. The wife. In 1 First, in First Timothy 3, 2, and 12. Likewise in dignity. There Here's what's interesting. People say, well, how do you know that's a wife and not women? <laughs> I'll tell you why. There's, there's no verb. There is no verb in this Greek sentence. It is the only sentence where the word deacon is not used, meaning it is attached to that whole subject matter of deacons. That's just how you get it. That's called the Greek language. Notice there's a negative. The deacon be good, could be disqualified by his wife. She must not be a malicious gossiper, referring to a pattern of sins of the tongue. But she must be temperate, refers to not overindulgence of the flesh, such as alcohol, food, etc. Faithful in all things pertaining to church affairs, along with her deacon husband. See, I, I, learned, I learned something a long time ago with this passage. And I don't do it all the time just because time. But I include wives in my deacon meetings. I bring it, listen, because the deacon 
needs to be, have a confidant in his home that he can share with and pray with. And they're going to do it anyway. And so I include him. Because the Bible tells me to. I include him. I, we don't do it on every meeting because sometimes it's just, quote, business type of things. Uh, but when it's the affair, bigger affairs of the church, I include husbands and their wives in the big discussion. I found it to be true with my wife. I mean, she was my confidant. I mean, I, I go home and pull my soul out. And we hit the floor and prayed and did what we had to do to survive uh, the attacks and things you get from the ministry. So, uh, temperate, faithful in all things. Uh, the, the husband must be the husband of one wife. By that, the reference means that he has a biblical marriage or a biblical remarriage. Okay? We examine him in regard to that. A husband of one wife refers to a biblical marriage, a marriage between a believer and a believer, or a remarriage, they, he still qualifies. It just depends on the circumstances. And I'll be glad to discuss this later when we come in. I can go into great details. Uh, I have many pastor friends that I'm in conference with all the time that are really finding it hard to find deacons today because there is so much divorce and leaving and and messes. It is getting more difficult in the church of Jesus Christ to find qualified deacons. Think about that. Because we've just sold out to the culture. Well, anyhow, we hope to find them. Uh, six, spiritual qualification regarding parenting. If they have children at home, they need to be good managers. That word for managers here in the Greek language means the ability to rule. The ability to rule or lead. When we talk, when God talks about rule, he's talking about how you lead. How you lead. How you lead. A good manager or leader of his children in the Lord in the affairs of his household without being neglectful of priorities, times, and needs in order to lead the church by the same manner. Look, look, if you're a jerk at home, you're going to be a jerk in the church, right? We're not, we're not interested in jerks now. I don't want you to, if, you're, if your marriage is in a mess and your family's in a mess and they're in chaos, we would encourage you to go back and get it in order because God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians 14, 30. He's a God of order, not disorder. I don't need to have you bring that disorder of your household into the church. <clears throat> and so that's part of it. And finally, the spiritual rewards for an honorable service as a deacon. Those who serve well as deacons, serving well in the office of a deacon is spelled out in the context. One, he has obtained for himself a high standard. Bathmos is an interesting word because it refers to earning a spiritual reputation, not just among his church. Listen to me now but among the churches. I have always been blessed by God to have deacons that qualified to serve with us during different lengths of time who had an enormous ministry to other churches. Many of you don't know, I just mentioned one couple because a lot of people would know this couple. Bill Dennis and Sylvia. Bill Dennis and Sylvia 
were the epitome of what you look for in a deacon and his wife. They were so honorable in our church that their influence of honor spread to other churches. I mean across the plains. And we have always had those men. God has blessed us because we are careful to try to select these people. You people select them, and then we screen them. We test them. We talk to them. We examine them uh, by the word of God. So they obtained for themselves a high standing, and they also obtained for themselves great confidence in the faith. This refers to their doctrinal influence, not only inside their church, but outside their church to other churches. To other churches. And other churches do the same thing with us. They're great. I, I've been connected to some one, but I'm connected to Jack and his church, know him well. And their deacons have always worked with ours on, on many projects. Marriage conference is one example where we would work together and merge and do things in camps and other activities. I had the same thing with other people. Buddy Peak up in Huntsville. Buddy and I did the same thing. We used to, some of you might remember, we used to do our big 4th of July picnics. And they would come down and other churches would come over from Rome, Georgia. And Buddy would bring his people in from from Huntsville, and we would just have these wonderful times together. This is the way it's supposed to be. That pastor and his deacons would come down with their people, and we would just have the most fun you could ever imagine of common-minded people. We look for that. So I'm looking for five people. You write these five names down. You write these five names down. Uh, by the end of the month, I want all this turned back in. Fill it out and turn it in. I doubt if you could do it today because you need a little more prayer time than that, in my opinion. But I don't know. What do I know? Um, fill it out, both the front. Give me five names of five men. All right? Give me as many as you can give me. I would like five because I need three. I have one. <laughs> one is not enough. He's the only... Rick Owen is the only ordained, examined deacon I have. All right? That's serving on my board. So uh, I, need, I need three. So, well, I, you know, I need what the Lord gives me, don't I? <laughs> uh, hopefully, you know, a, a wish list, I guess, maybe. And then on the back side, if you would like to become a founding member, Write it out. Remember, this is your Sunday church business. Write it out. Fill it out. Uh, and turn that in. All right? We're starting to, we'll start collecting that. We'll, we'll do this uh, every year, 22, 23, and 24, uh, to be founded members. All right? Let me, let's have a word of prayer. We're going to take the offering. Uh, and then we're going to have some music. Then I'm going to look at the clock. And if I got a little more time, I'm going to teach a little bit more. If not, we're going to break at 11 and have fellowship together. If you've come today and you didn't bring food, we have plenty. So come and eat with us and fellowship with us. Come and eat and fellowship with us. Be sure not to, we'll, we'll take you to lunch today, okay? So be sure to do that. All right, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. And then Ed will come and they'll do some music and then we'll see what time we are, whether or not I've had enough time to give you a little study besides what we did. Right. Father, we thank you today. We, we are thankful to be in Moody, Alabama. And Father, we want to reach all of St. Clair County with the truth of the Word of God. We want Bible studies all over this place. We want them in Pale City, and we want them in Raglan, and, and I don't know, all Asheville, and all these little towns that make up our county. 
We want to simulate the truth, Father. The truth of the Word of God. So many people don't know all the basics and raise up an army of, of young men and women who will go forth and teach. Just hold Bible studies and teach the truth of the Word of God. Not looking to build anything but the body of Christ. So we pray for that. We pray, Father, that this offering would go spend as little on ourselves as we can and most on the kingdom to send the word of God throughout the city of Moody and out through the St. Clair, out of the United States, out into the uttermost parts of the earth. A small church with a big vision. There's Grace Valley. And we're thankful for it, Father. Our vision should always be bigger than we are. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.